An epic song needs an epic music video. And our epic music video for Uprising is very epic. It's totally epic. I'm Spartacus Olson, sitting in for Indy for this second episode covering Sabaton's song Uprising. Today we look to Paris and the French Resistance' last stand against German occupation during World War II. It is mid-August 1944. The Allied offensive in France has broken through the German lines in Normandy and is gaining critical momentum. Local resistance groups emerge from the underground, supporting the Allies with important intelligence and by harassing the retreating German soldiers. By the 15th, the Allied armies are on their way to liberate Chartres, just 100 kilometers from Paris. With the capital finally in reach, the French government in exile feels that the moment of liberation has finally come. The Free French Armor Division of General Leclerc is eagerly awaiting to make their decisive move. Inside Paris, everyday life is grinding to a halt. The metro closed, gas supply out, and fuels severely lacking. Electricity is limited to just one hour a day at 22.30. And then the entire police force goes on strike. All emergency responders and prison guards refuse to further obey the fascist prefecture and publicly walk out, declaring they will only take orders from the French resistance. They are soon followed by the public servants of the railways, postal services, funeral services, and water utilities. Paris grows closer to a general strike by the day. For the ordinary Parisian citizen, even the simplest commodities become dangerously scarce. The Résistance itself is bustling with energy. For four years they have dreamt for this moment, the day to rise up fully against the humiliating German occupation, against the Nazi crimes, the mass arrests, the executions, the theft. But although fascist power is disintegrating, the Germans are still there with tanks and machine guns. From inside the Senate, German military administration centers around the decisions of General Dietrich von Scholtitz. Von Scholtitz had only arrived at the beginning of August and was immediately faced with the sheer impossible task to keep Paris from descending into chaos. Paris itself has no strategic value, but with the German forces facing collapse in the west, it is of major importance to keep control of the bridges over the Seine and the routes through the city open for the retreat. Von Scholtitz publishes threats. He will employ the most brutal means of repression and retribution if German soldiers are attacked. Spirits, soul and heart, in accordance with the old traditions. 1944, still the hours go away. With the front drawing closer by the day, the two major resistance groups argue about the date for insurrection. The conservatives and liberals, influenced by the Free French plea to wait for Leclerc to arrive, argue for patience. The communists call for strikes and immediate open war against the German occupiers. But with official administration and propaganda apparatus gone, Paris begins drifting into an atmosphere of rumors. Would the capital be declared an open city and spared from the fighting, or would it be another Warsaw? Would they rise up or wait? The resistance now fails miserably to find a common course of action. Paris, as this has been for centuries in times of crisis, becomes unpredictable. At the same time, von Scholtitz is evacuating the city. In fear of retribution at the hands of the Parisian, many collaborators flee in panic. Endless streams of cars and lorries packed with soldiers, officials, and collaborators carry everything of value out of the city. Radio Paris, the instrument of Nazi propaganda for the last couple of years, suddenly falls silent. The collaborationist journalists and producers flee the city. Typewriters are hastily packed and compromising documents burnt. As the Germans retreat and the resistance argue, the city descends into looting and chaos. Most Parisians are overjoyed by the sight of the leaving Germans, though. People are celebrating, at first in private, then out in the streets with wine and song, and now, with the print shops abandoned, the resistance members simply walk in and begin printing their own papers again. Every night, 
At 2230, thousands of radios suddenly erupt back into life, carrying the voice of the BBC radio broadcasts. But the Allies have no plans to move on the French capital anytime soon. The Americans have repeatedly told Leclerc that they will circumvent the German garrison and encircle the city instead. In fact, capturing Paris would mean that the Allies immediately have to supply its millions of inhabitants with food and resources, which could endanger the whole front. So while the Allies take their time, many smaller resistance groups are determined to fight. There are as many striking policemen as remaining German soldiers, and if an insurrection could bring the whole city to join a popular uprising, the Germans would surely be overwhelmed. By the night of the 17th, the last officials of the fascist regime have left Paris. Only a few thousand Germans and SS men are roving the city. Not enough to stop the Allies, but enough to fight an insurrection. The situation grows more dangerous by the hour. The Germans get jumpy, patrolling next to rows of posters and graffiti calling for their deaths. The motley crews of French résistantes, Catholics, nationalists, liberals, or communists, despite their differences, are united in their desire to fight the German occupation. Outfitted with different small arms smuggled in or stolen, they break the curfew, ambush patrols, or throw grenades into German lorries. The young resistance fighters see it as a matter of honor that they are liberating their capital on their own. Each night, the Paris sky is illuminated by flames. Gunshots echo through the night, accompanied by yelling, both in German and French. The insurgents begin occupying the town halls, the mairies. Although they have no military value, the buildings representing the democracy of pre-war Paris carry immense symbolic value to unite Parisians into insurrection. The French tricolore flag rising over the mairies signals the beginning of the struggle. People now take to the streets wearing the armbands of the resistance or sing the Marseillaise in support from their balconies. Von Scholtitz continues to issue his threats, but they are by now mostly bluffs. He knows that a brutal repression will only make the situation worse, and he is running out of options. He has neither enough men nor clout to keep the resistance in check. So von Scholtitz is now willing to compromise and offers the resistance a ceasefire. But once again, the resistance leaders are deeply divided and no decision is made. Ultimately, it doesn't matter. On Sunday, 19th of August, the uprising begins on its own. A large group of former policemen storm the Prefecture de Police, declaring it liberated in the name of General de Gaulle. French flags fly high over the city. The headquarter of the now-gone collaborationist fascist administration is thrashed and burned. The German garrison is put on full alert, with orders to punish the insurgents without hesitation. On their way to the Prefecture, they come under fire from the resistance. The Germans act with force. Armored cars and tiger tanks rumble through the streets, shooting into stores and buildings, trying to flush out the insurgents. All day long, firefights are reported and blood fills the Parisian gutters. Women and children caught in the crossfires are fatally hit by shrapnel and ricocheting bullets. Brave Parisians waving flags of Red Cross dodge through the fighting, trying to save the wounded. By the end of the day, more than half of the city is in the hands of the resistance. Women, men, and children fight. They will die in side by side. And the blood they shed upon the streets was a sacrifice willingly paid. War, so city at war. Voices from underground whispers of freedom. Off the sides of the actual combat, the uprising develops into a public gathering. Parisians watch and discuss the fighting like spectators at a football game. Women in their best dresses share champagne and cigarettes. Jews rip up their yellow stars and finally, after years of hiding, come out into the open. But not everyone is happy about the insurgency. There is fear of a communist takeover for industrialists, artists, and writers who had prospered during the Germans. There is the real prospect of being seen as traitors and collaborators. Others argue cynically, why fight now when liberation was just around the corner? Is this just a way to redeem ourselves for years of inaction and peaceful coexistence with the Germans? Some joined the insurgents to unleash their anger and frustration. Women, accused of collaborating, are dragged through the streets, their heads shaven and marked with a swastika. Captured German soldiers are humiliated and beaten by the crowd. Some are shot 
without a trial. The SS retort with equal brutality. Everyone who seems suspicious is simply fired upon. German tanks shoot buildings to pieces in reprisals, while the resistance answer with Molotov cocktails from the windows. News of the uprising soon spreads outside the city. It makes de Gaulle and Leclerc even more anxious to reach the capital as quickly as possible. As the leader of the Free French, de Gaulle is finally about to set his foot once again on French soil. Leclerc orders a few of his men to ignore the American orders and instead make their way to the front. If the Americans suddenly choose to enter Paris, the French have to be there. The week of August 21st begins with the renewal of the fighting. All talks of ceasefire are now forgotten. New posters proclaim, everyone get a hun, everyone to the barricades. Machine guns and grenades bark throughout the day. Sniper shots echo from the rooftops. From Scholtitz realizes that the situation in Paris is untenable. Then a handwritten order from Berlin arrives at his desk. In it, Hitler declares that Paris was not to be given up. He would rather see Paris reduced to a heap of rubble than fall into the enemy hands. Von Scholtitz allegedly reacts to this message with, disgust. Even if he would have wanted to obey the order, he neither has the manpower nor the control over the city. He cynically remarks that he could always topple the Eiffel Tower in order to block the Allied advance. Nonetheless, rumors of a German destruction of the city is causing panic and the myth of the mine city with a detonator in von Scholtitz's office spreads. After lengthy discussions, the US Army finally declares that it will cautiously advance on Paris. If the German resistance is as weak as the French spies make it out to be, then the capital might be liberated after all. Excited, Leclerc immediately orders all of his men to move full speed towards Paris. In the evening of the 24th, the Leclerc division finally arrives. People take to the streets yelling, Vive la France! Vive de Gaulle! Vive les Alliés! Young girls climb the tanks to shower the men in flowers and kisses. Throughout the night, the bells ring out all over the city and people celebrate. The Allied tanks bring the needed firepower, but the German opposition doesn't just surrender. Fighting continues all day around the Eiffel Tower and the Arc de Triomphe, often resulting in spectacular tank-on-tank -tank battles, but the German defeat is ultimately inevitable. By the afternoon, French soldiers storm the Senate and von Scholtitz's office, arrest him and command him to order his troops to surrender. He agrees, and as the swastika flag is torn down from the Senate building and is replaced by the French Bleu, Blanc et Rouge, four years of brutal German occupation of Paris has finally come to an end. In the music video for Uprising, you have Peter Stormare or Peter Stormare in America, <laughs> but he's Swedish. But how did you how did you get him to do this? I mean, a music video, not a big film or anything. Yeah, actually, it's very interesting. So um, Peter Stormare is first of all a fan of heavy metal, so uh -huh. that's okay. that helps. But he gets a lot of requests, like. Uh, uh, okay, do you want to go and do a music video in the desert, look cool, be a badass guy? And he's like, no, boring, 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 boring. Yeah. All the requests that he gets, boring, 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 boring. And then it's like, do you want to go to Poland and play uh, SS uh, officer? Not boring, I'm coming. Yeah. And uh, then he was very excited about it. And he was like, oh, Sabaton, wow, this band, I can be, be playing. This is a great role to play. And the local producer in Poland also got several Polish famous actors in okay. there. Okay. Yeah. And uh, there was uh, when we saw the cast, we we're like, oh, "Wow, this is gonna be very interesting." And we started to see that okay, the the costume maker was also working on uh, Schindler's List, this oh, movie. Right. Okay. And we had a lot of famous people. The camera team was extremely experienced, and there were so many reenactors. When we arrived in Poland, after a lot of endeavors, because it was not so easy. First of all, we are deciding we're gonna shoot this uh, this uh, week. We're gonna film. Yeah. So we have uh, Peter Stormare gonna fly over from America, and we're gonna fly down from Sweden, and we're gonna get all these people together. There's 300 people working for this music video. Wow. It's exactly at this time when the uh, Polish president goes down in the plane. Ooh. 
So there is a, a national uh, sorrow. Yeah. Uh, they're uh, called out. So we are. You're not allowed to do any kind of entertainment for the whole week. So the whole production is postponed. And uh, I remember also talking to Peter Stormer because uh, with him, this was an insurance issue. And I remember him explaining um, on the phone to me how he talked about with his uh, agent uh, in the insurance thing. And like, can you imagine that this is the American president being shot down? This is how they feel in Poland now. Do yeah. you think that that's an insurance issue? And the guy was like, yeah. So we, uh, he, he got us out of that and we didn't have to uh, pay another thing for that. But then we decided to do it again, yeah. this music video. And what happens then? It's the uh, volcanic eruption oh, on, yeah, on Iceland. Yeah. So all flights in Europe is canceled. So we again, we cannot do the music video. And again, we have to call a force majeure and fight with uh, an American insurance company. And thanks to Peter, who is, really wants to do this. Yeah. So he could basically here, take the money and walk away. Yeah. But he really wants to fight with the insurance company and uh, make sure that we are not double paid or something. But at the third time, we arrive in Poland and uh, Peter is super excited. We go out and we're going to do this press conference. We got all of Poland's media there and it's very imp impressive at the Warsaw Uprising Museum. Yeah. And the first question to him is like, Peter, how do you feel about historical things? And uh, how does it feel for you to, to do this kind of music video? And he says... Dolores, I'm only here for the money. <laughs> and it kills the whole mood immediately. Because he's the, the kind of crazy guy that he would just do things like that. And everybody's a bit shocked and like, okay, wow. And then the second thing is something like, how do you feel about the, the Poland and the history of Poland? It's like, yeah, you know, in, in the good times, Poland was kind of occupied by Sweden. And, and everybody's again shocked. But... Good, as good actor and a good uh, entertaining person he is, he turns it all around, makes it a very beautiful story, how, how he feels about it. And he has very well studied the history of Poland, very well studied Uprising and the Warsaw Uprising, and he, he has very well spoken okay. about it. So he turns it around and makes it very emotional. During the music video, there is a lot of things happening. Of yeah. course, um, it's unbeatable when we are going from set A to set B. And uh, uh, we all have these transportation cars. Yeah. But Peter, he decides to walk. Okay. Fully dressed as the SS officer in streets of <laughs> Warsaw. He's unstoppable. Yeah, yeah. And he wanted to do this as part of a promotional thing for the music video, of course, to attract a little attention. And he did. But then, uh, as we were on set, there was also these other super emotional uh, things that happened. For example, there is, uh, in, uh, in Warsaw, there's a... Uh, a little kid with a helmet like this. Yeah. And he stands as a statue representing that uh, during the Warsaw Uprising, there was a lot of kids fighting for the resistance yeah. and bringing messages and stuff. Sure. And um, we wanted to capture that in the music video. And inside of the music video was a little kid running around and everybody thinks he's so cute in the uniform and, and um, a lot of people take pictures with him. And then an old man walks into the set and he looks at the kid and he's like, that's me. Wow and everybody gets silent on the set and understands that he knows, he recognized how he would oh. look like at that time. So oh, very the whole hitting. set got silent yeah. and it was like one of those, let's take a break now and take a deep breath because what just happened? So mm. that was a, a very emotional thing. And uh, the, the emotional launch of the music video, which was actually aired on uh, Polish television on the right. day of the uprising. Oh, okay. A sponsor went in and without benefit for their own cause, yeah. without presenting their own um, brand or anything, yeah. they just uh, paid to have the full music video. So they bought commercial space to, just to, have, this. to have the message of this on the Warsaw that's Uprising very Day. Cool. And Whoever that's that how was, the, that's cool. the music video was. Uh, launched. Well, and of course, I know a lot of people are going to go over and watch the video now. Many who've seen it before, probably everybody's seen it before, but you might look at it in a little bit of a different way after the stories that you've heard today and in part one and the stories that you've heard from Pear about the video. Uh, well, that is it for today, yeah? Yeah. But we'll see you next time here on the Sabaton History Channel. All right.
right, everybody. Thank you for watching this week's episode. And don't forget to subscribe, become Patreon, and click the little bells and everything else that you need to do to become a fully supporter of this channel. Thank you for your support. Thank you.